Good, so let me share my screen. Start. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Good. All right. So, <clears throat> so today I want to, I want to hopefully round off this first introductory pass um, into the path integral, um, and um, our learning goals for today will be to explore what's called the saddle point approximation, um, which is uh, otherwise known as the semi-classical approximation. Um, <clears throat> am I recording it? Yes. Okay. The saddle point approximation, otherwise known as the semi-classical um, approximation, and then I'll show how this connects to the classical limit, um, and in particular, the principle of least action. And then if we have time to, um, uh, today, uh, otherwise on Wednesday, um, we'll make the transition from quantum mechanics to statistical mechanics, um, which uh, you may be familiar with. And even if you're not, um, this is a good introduction to the topic um, from the point of view of path integrals. So let's summarize what we know um, to date. Um, so by way of summary, the quantity we're trying to calculate in, in, these, in these examples and, and the formal things that we're developing in the last couple of lectures is the quantum mechanical amplitude for a particle to go from some state x at time t equals zero to some state x prime at time uh, at some later time, let's say capital T. And what we found was formulating it the way Feynman did, um, it is a sum over parts with an equal unimodular weight uh, e to the i s h i s over h bar for every classical path connecting um, the endpoints in space time. So, <clears throat> just to summarize, then of where we are so far, the quantum mechanical amplitude. Um, so the quantum amplitude is given by a sum over all parts connecting an initial state of the system to a final state of the system with equal unimodular weight. E to the I S over H bar. Okay. So this is the story and everything else that we're developing around it, um, everything else that we're developing is, is developed around this particular um, story. As we sum over all of these parts, we have all possible parts that connect the initial state to the final state. We've got some parts that are completely crazy parts, right? And, and these crazy oscillating exponentials um, will cancel out and near a path where the action is an extremum, um, the action is nearly constant. And the phases um, around such paths add up in a coherent way to give a sizable contribution to the amplitude. In other words, we're computing this amplitude um, summing over all possible paths from some initial state to some final state. And there are a bunch of amplitudes 
there, sorry, there are a bunch of contributions to this amplitude that come from near a classical path. And a classical path is one where the action is an extrema mat. And then there's a whole bunch of other um, unimaginably complicated, crazy paths, right? And the way the formalism works is that all of those crazy paths um, cancel each other out. And what's left is really the contributions that come from the paths near where S is an extremum. And these kinds of paths must give an order one contribution to the path integral. And if they give an order one contribution to the path integral, then looking at the structure of the unimodular weight, um, this means that these paths must be roughly h bar away from the classical path. In other words, if I take the h bar going to zero limit, then I can forget about all except for the classical paths and its coherent neighbors. In other words, <clears throat> What you'll find by this reasoning is that um, the amplitude k of x prime t x naught going from the state x to x prime, which remember our formal statement is that this is the integral over all paths x of t that start at um, x and end at x prime e to the i s over h bar is basically approximated by some number a, some prefactor a, um, that reflects the sum over all nearby paths, near to the classical path, e to the i s classical over h bar, where this quantity here is the prefactor um, that comes from summing over nearby paths, paths nearby the classical path, so, so this comes from um, the sum over nearby pods and This piece here is the classical action. By which I mean the action evaluated on a classical solution. In the H bar going to zero limit, we tend to focus on just the exponential, this e to the i semi-classical, s semi-classical, s classical over, act, uh, over H bar. Um, piece and ignore the prefactor. However, um, we can exert a little more effort and actually calculate um, uh, the prefactor A by systematically including fluctuations around the classical path, let's call it H, uh, X classical of T. And this is really what we mean by the semi-classical or saddle point approximation. And the reason it's called a saddle point approximation is because if you think back to your course in complex analysis, when you were doing a saddle point approximation of a saddle point evaluation of a particular of, of integrals, um, this is exactly what you were doing. You were fixing a particular path, and then you were looking at um, essentially quadratic um, quadratic fluctuations around that path, um, and that gave you this, the saddle point approximation. And it works. The saddle point approximation works in this limit because what we're really interested in is a particle that is becoming so macroscopic in this limit that small changes in its path give huge changes in its action measured in, 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 in units of h bar. Okay, so let's write that down so that we so that we have it in mind. So the statement here is um, the semi-classical limit is 
So the semi classical or saddle point approximation is one where um, we can compute A by systematically including fluctuations around X classical of T. Okay. Um, and again, this approximation works because in this limit, in the semi-classical limit, um, where h bar is small, we're focusing in on a particle that is becoming so macroscopic that small changes in its path gives huge change contributions to its action. So let's let's see if we can build some approximation for this saddle point. Uh, sorry, let's see if we can build some intuition for um, this saddle point approximation um, by looking at a, a toy model. And the toy model I want to look at here is, is, is not actually a path integral. It's, um, it's a normal uh, one-dimensional integral. But it'll teach us the lessons that we need to, to learn to consider um, the um, uh, saddle point approximation in the more complicated examples of path integrals in quantum mechanics or uh, quantum field theory. So to build some intuition, Consider the following. Um, suppose I have the integral z and I define it to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of some dx e to the minus alpha times some function f of x. Okay. Again, you would have probably seen integrals like this in a course in complex in a uh, advanced, well, I guess, toward the end of a standard course in quantum in, in complex um, complex variables. Because I've integrated out any x dependence, the resulting function z is really a function of alpha and not a number. And I can think of this alpha as a parameter. So I can tune this parameter. And in particular, I'm interested in what happens when this parameter alpha is very large. So the question we'd like to ask here is, um, What happens to Z of alpha as alpha goes to infinity? Okay. And by what happens here, I'm really interested in the behavior, the dominant behavior of this Z of alpha. <clears throat> well, clearly, 
the dominant contribution to this integral, um, the dominant contribution to this integral comes from a point um, along x where f of x is the smallest because of the minus sign in the exponential. Where f of x is large um, and alpha is large, then e to the minus some large number um, is going to zero. <coughs> so the biggest contribution I'm going to get is one where f of x is the smallest. Okay, so let's make a note of that. The largest, uh, the dominant contribution to Z of alpha in this limit is going to come from wherever f of x um, is smallest. Okay. So let's follow this line of reasoning. So suppose, suppose the function that we're looking at, f of x, has only one minimum. And this minimum is located at, let's say, some point x equals x naught. Um, so near, so let's, let's make this point. Suppose that f of x has only one minimum at x equal x naught. Then near this point, um, we can make an uh, we can make a Taylor expansion of f of x. So near x naught, I can write f of x as f of x naught plus a half. Okay, let's write it like this. Um, plus a half f double prime of x naught times x minus x naught squared plus terms that are at least order x cubed. Okay, um, there's no linear contribution here because I've assumed that f is minimized um, at uh, at x naught, so f prime of x naught equals zero, and the terms that are cubic and higher will be subdominant in the limit that alpha um, goes to infinity. So let's make a note of that. There's no linear piece. Since f prime of x naught, we assumed is zero. And these terms are subdominant as alpha goes to infinity. So we really only need to focus on two terms, f at x naught and the term that's quadratic in, um, in x. <clears throat> Is everybody with me? Yes. Good. So if we substitute back into um, uh, z of alpha, we'll find that z of alpha goes to e to the minus alpha f 
of x naught, that's the constant piece, times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus half alpha f double prime at x naught, x minus x naught squared integrated with respect to x. Okay, now I can certainly do that integral. It's just a Gaussian integral. So we, let's do the Gaussian integral. And this is the square root of two pi over alpha f double prime at x naught. And what's left is this e to the minus alpha f of x naught piece, All right? <clears throat> so there are two parts to this integral and this is a standard one dimensional integral, okay? So I, this, there's nothing path integrally about this. This is a straight up one dimensional integral. We just want to make a point. Here. The point is the following. In the limit where this parameter epsilon, uh, sorry, alpha goes large, we have two contributions to Z. The leading contribution comes from the so-called saddle point. In other words, the evaluation of F of X, the thing sitting in the exponential in the integrand at the classical trajectory, at the trajectory that minimizes um, uh, F. This is, sorry, at the point on, along X that minimizes F, in other words, at X naught. So this is the leading contribution that, um, that's called the saddle point. So this is the saddle point contribution and that's the leading piece. And here's the prefactor. This is the prefactor that I said can be computed. And in fact, that's exactly what we did. And the prefactor we found comes from the fluctuations around X naught from the near, from the next contribution in the Taylor expansion. So this prefactor then comes from um, from the fluctuations. Around X naught. So uh, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. So why are we calling this point a saddle point when it's a minima in reality? Because in general, in general, um, I don't know that it's a minimum or a maximum. Um, and in general, uh, it, it, it's a point where, okay, so the minimum or the maximum comes from, uh, comes typically from where uh, F double prime yeah. is either positive or negative. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so in, in general, in the theory of, uh, of complex functions, these kinds of points, this particular kinds of points um, are called saddle points on the complex plane. So in this case, this is in fact um, a minimum by assumption, um, well, actually it's not. Uh, so at this point, I haven't told you anything about F double prime. Okay, so it could be a minimum, it could be a maximum. I've just yeah. assumed that this is a, that this is a, um, a, an extremum. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. The nomenclature comes from more general considerations. So a quick calculation I will ask you to justify our choice of dropping the higher order terms in the expansion. Uh, so a uh, uh, little question again. Mm -hmm. So if F double prime is actually like uh, if we are not uh, on a minima and instead we are on a maxima, then F double prime is going to be uh, negative, right? 
so mm-hmm. in that case the uh, the a it it's going to be like uh, complex is it even allowed here because it's under root 1 by f double prime x not so is is it allowed to be complex uh is a allowed to be complex well in this case i want a real integral so uh, no but um in in general yeah i can have a complex um i can have a complex factor a okay so this is still valid when we are considering maximums yeah 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 okay great thank yeah. you you in that case uh, just give me a second in that case if you're considering um maxima um what you'll find is you're at some unstable point or something like that certainly valid certainly physical you know um take a inverted harmonic oscillator for example um there you will find exactly this kind of complex uh, uh factor that tells you that that you're at an unstable point okay 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 so justify dropping the higher order terms okay now note that this is an approximation okay but if f of x has no cubic or higher order terms um in its taylor expansion then this expression that we found for um for the um for z of alpha is exact so if f of x has no cubic or higher terms then um z of alpha is exactly square root of 2 pi over alpha f double prime of x not e to the minus alpha f of x not okay otherwise it is just an approximation <clears throat> and this remains true not only for this simple one dimensional integral but also for the path integral so if the lagrangian if a lagrangian um which you will integrate over time to get the action has no terms that are cubic or higher order in x or x dot then there's an exact expression for the path integral as just a e to the i s classical over h bar is that clear so this also holds in for the path integral okay um uh, okay that, so yeah. i still have a little like misgivings about uh, having like uh, Didn't we say that f x has got to be like uh, the smallest or minimum if we are to get uh, the maximum contribution to the amplitude? Yes, I did say that. So in this case, it's going to come out positive. But my my statement is that um, if I take the inverted oscillator, for example, okay, okay, and then just flip everything around. So if I take the inverted, if I take an inverted, okay. So let's take the 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 oscillator. So there your f of x corresponds to a quadratic potential. Okay? Yes. The inverted and then you do everything that you that I've just said and it will come out fine. On the other hand, if I flip the the potential around, 
right? Yeah. Then yeah. a parity transformation takes me to the same quadratic potential. Yeah. And I can do exactly the same thing, except that I'll come out with a, with a complex um, value for A. Yeah, yeah. But then again, you, you will still have this e to the power minus alpha f x naught, right? Uh, or f x. Then again, we'll be saying that uh, f x has got to be have the like smallest value and not the largest value. No. So there, so there, indeed, I will get the largest value to to. Um, so there, I will get the while I will get the smallest value to the largest contribution to the exponential coming from where f is minimum, in some sense, when I change uh, f to minus f to get this inverted potential, I will get this, okay, the, yeah. the largest contribution to minus f. Yeah, 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 got it. Okay? Yeah, thank you. So in the path integral case, then I will say that z is a, um, e to the i s classical over h bar exactly. All right. Let's see how this works in an example. And we have an example. We have an example of the free particle that we've computed previously. So let's see how this works. Um, now that we've learned about the semi-classical approximation. So in the case of the free particle, so for a free particle, the action S S of X of t is the integral from x at naught to x prime at t of a half m v squared. So that's x dot of t squared. Right? This action is clearly quadratic, and the classical path joining um, x at naught to x prime at t um, is clearly a straight line in space-time with constant velocity. So the classical path is a straight line which the particle traverses with constant velocity Um, v equal to x prime minus x all over t. So that if I evaluate the classical action, um, the classical action is then just s classical, which is the integral from zero to t of a half v squared dt, v is a constant, m is a constant. So this is nothing but um, a half m times x prime minus x squared over T. So together with our previous argument, then we can immediately write down that the amplitude k at x prime 
t starting from x naught is just a of t times the exponential of i m over two h bar t times x prime minus x squared. Okay. And we can compute the prefactor a of t by doing a Gaussian functional integral around the straight line. However, we can also make another observation that would allow us to deduce what the answer is, um, which I'm going to leave for you as an exercise, as a quick calculation. Uh, in fact, let's make a note of that. So this can be computed by doing the Gaussian functional integral Around the straight line. Or with a quick calculation, um, using the following observation. So if I use the fact that one, um, the limit as t goes to zero, so remember, I'm starting my, my particle off at <clears throat> some state x at time t equals zero and ending it off at some state x prime at capital T. If I bring these two states closer and closer together in state space um, so that I let t go to zero, capital T go to zero, in that case, the limit um, The limit of k x prime t x naught is has got delta function support, so that's delta of x minus uh, x prime, and point two is that. Um, I can find a representation for the delta function that says that it is the limit as delta goes to zero of one over pi delta squared um, all to the half times the exponential e to the minus x minus x prime squared over delta squared. So if you remember how we think of Gaussian functions as a limiting case, right? So, sorry, not Gaussian, delta functions as a limiting case. Um, one such limiting sequence I can think of is a sequence of Gaussian functions. So I have some Gaussian function with the normalized area, and that's what that one over pi delta squared uh, to the half factor is doing for you. It's giving you a, 
unit area under that curve so that if I do the integral of delta of x minus x prime over x, I get one. And then what I do is I make the width of the Gaussian go to zero. So I squeeze the Gaussian and to preserve the area, I've got to stretch the area vertically. Um, and that's what that limit delta goes to zero um, does for you. So these two facts together, allow me to deduce that the, um, that the prefactor is A of T is simply M over two pi H bar IT. Okay, which is exactly what we found previously. Okay, any questions? No. Okay, so now I now I want to move on to the next sort of substantial section that we're going to think about, which is how to use the path integral, the language of path integrals to think about statistical mechanics. Now, statistical mechanics is a microscopic theory of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is a macroscopic observation of how more or less energy flows in classical system, right? And you learn already in undergraduate physics that there is a microscopic description of this um, that tells us about how um, systems interact, how systems with a large number of degrees of freedom um, interact. And because you can't get an exact description of such systems with large numbers of degrees of freedom, quantum mechanical systems with large number of degrees of freedom, really you have to resort to a statistical um, description of such systems. And this statistical description is exactly what we call statistical mechanics. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that the path integral um, gives us an elegant way to do statistical mechanics precisely because the path integral gives us a, an elegant in representation, an elegant integral representation for the, path, for the partition function. And if you will recall uh, your elementary courses in quantum mechanics or statistical mechanics, you will know that the partition function is really the core object in, in statistical mechanics. And from the partition function, you can derive all the, the necessary thermodynamic quantities that you might want to study. For example, the the free energy, the entropy, all of these things derive from the partition function. And we'll see this quite clearly a little later when we do, when we return to statistical mechanics of um, systems in equilibrium and out of equilibrium, um, where we'll discuss things like uh, finite temperature field theory uh, or, or how to think about these systems at finite temperatures. Um, so the story here is that um, from the part, path integral, uh, so I'm just summarizing what I've just said. So the path integral gives an integral representation for the partition function. Um, and from the partition function, <clears throat> we can get all of the thermodynamics, uh, thermodynamic quantities that we might be interested in. So this quantity that we were calling, you know, K, of x prime t, x of naught um, is related to uh, 
is related to this partition function, which is typically called Z, and Z is typically a function of the inverse temperature. And this thing is then related to um, thermodynamic quantities like the entropy, the free energy, the Gibbs free energy, etc. Okay. So knowing what the path integral is gives us a, a really interesting new representation for statistical mechanics. So I just want to I just want to touch base with this for the moment, and um, and then I'm going to give you your your first exercise in this um, uh, section, which is to compute the path integral for the um, harmonic oscillator. And then on Wednesday we'll pick up again from that from the answer to to that exercise um, and show how to compute the the partition function for um, the harmonic oscillator. So let me show you how these things are related to start off. So recall from, I don't know, your first course in quantum mechanics or statistical mechanics that the partition function Um, <clears throat> in a statistical mechanical system is given by, in a statistical mechanical system with Hamiltonian H, the partition function Z, which is a function, actually, let's, yeah, Z or beta, is given by the sum of the states J, E to the minus beta ej, where um, beta is the inverse temperature. So it's one over Boltzmann constant times the temperature of the system. And this is typically the, the parameter that we, that we are concerned with in um, statistical mechanical systems. And Ej here is the energy of the state J. Okay. So from this definition, we can write in fact, let me, let me just, I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. So this beta here, beta here is um, one over KT, the inverse temperature, of the system. And from this definition, I can write, um, I can write the partition function then as in the following way. It's a sum over J um, of J e to the minus I, sorry, e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian acting on the state J. Since um, the state J is assumed to be an energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So written like this, I can recognize then that um, the partition function is nothing but the trace over the Hilbert space of e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian. Okay, so let's let's just leave this for the moment and go to something else. 
Um, from our definition of the of the path integral, the propagator. K of x prime and t from x at naught, we know is what I get when I start with the state x propagated forward in time by the propagator e to the minus um, i h to t and then project it onto the state x prime. So just that. So now let's analytically continue this thing. Um, uh, sorry, let's analytically continue the time variable. So I'll replace t by minus i times beta, in which case this becomes, so what I'm doing here is I'm sending t to minus i beta. And this is what you would call in quantum, in, in complex variable theory, an analytic continuation of the time variable, in which case I get x prime e to the minus beta h acting on x. Well, it's kind of taking shape a little bit. And as usual, to get a concrete expression here, we insert a resolution of the identity in here. So insert a factor of pi. And then I'm going to resolve this identity um, in the fork basis on the Hilbert space. In other words, um, in energy eigenstates um, J. So then I write this thing as. Um, I write this thing as x prime e to the minus beta h sum over j of j outer product with j x and then I'll rearrange things a little bit so that this is um, the sum over j of e to the minus beta ej, which I get by acting on, um, on j with, uh, acting on the ket j with e to the minus beta h. And What's left is x prime j, j x, which I will reorganize to give um, sum over j, e to the minus beta e j times, in fact, let's put it on the next line. So sum over j, e to the minus beta ej, um, j x x prime j. And now we're nearly there, except I've got this x and x prime to think about, <clears throat> but I can always set x equal to x prime and do a circuit in Hilbert space. So I start at the state X and I end at the state X, okay? So if I set X equal to X prime, and then I integrate out over, um, over X. So let's set X equal X prime and integrate 
then I get the integral um, Let's do it this way. Then I'll find on the left-hand side that the integral over x of k of x prime, sorry, k of x minus i beta is what I've set capital T to, x naught. In other words, I'm starting from the state x at naught and I'm ending at the state x at uh, time, imaginary time, minus i beta. And on the right-hand side, I will get, on the right-hand side, I will get um, the sum over j, e to the minus beta ej, integral over x of x, x, um, sorry, j integral over x of x outer product x um, j. And this guy, is the identity. And so this is nothing but the partition function. In other words, the propagator, the amplitude that we computed using the path integral, evaluated at negative imaginary time is related to the partition function. And this is the, the, the transition between quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. So let's write that down just so we don't forget it. So the propagator evaluated at negative imaginary time um, is related by integration to the standard partition function. Of statistical mechanics. Okay, and this is the key takeaway from this particular section that I would like you to focus on. So as I said, um, at the end of this lecture, I'm going to upload the first tutorial uh, for this module, and it will be the computation of the path integral for the harmonic oscillator. And on Wednesday, we'll pick up here, and I will use that result. I don't expect you to have completed it, but at least give it a try before we get there um, uh, on, on Wednesday. But in any event, I'm going to make use of the answer that I know you're going to get to. Um, and I'm going to then use that to follow this prescription and compute the partition function for um, the harmonic oscillator. Any questions? Okay. If not, uh, so we... I do have a question. Go for it. So, uh, on the left hand side, we have this. Uh, uh, how we started k was that we are considering amplitude of a particle moving from x to x prime, uh, yep. x zero to x prime d. 
yeah. so now we have set uh, whatever we set t it's still a time and so what we are considering is that uh, amplitude of particle standing still for some time right since x prime is the same as x again i want you to think about this not as particles moving in space and time but as states of the system uh, yeah okay 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 so 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 essentially what's going what's happening here is i'm, I'm introducing rather sneakily i'm introducing the idea of a thermal circle so what i what i will have what i'm going toward not now but in a few lectures time um is the idea of compactifying the time direction into a circle okay so we start okay. off at a particular point and we end at that uh, at that same point along the thermal circle okay still this integral that we have this integral over x 